to the second episode of The Monthly Blend. I'm your co-host, Tian Wong. I'm the CEO of Opus 8, which invests in fintech, health tech, and marketing technology companies through our Phoenix Fund. And we also help early stage companies, other companies, and alternative investment managers raise money through our network of high net worth individuals and family offices. I'm also the founder of the Big Idea Connectpreneur community, which is a global community of over 20,000 investors, entrepreneurs, and innovators throughout the US, in fact, throughout the world. Um, the Monthly Blend is a monthly video podcast, which my co-host Anthony Millen and I have recently started. And the purpose of it is to bring together um, leaders and innovators from the Washington DC metropolitan area, also known as the DMV, which stands for District, Maryland, and Virginia. And uh, being in a tri-state locale, uh, there's a lot of silos, both governmental as well as individual and uh, corporate and institutional with federal agencies and universities. And Anthony and I, our vision is to create a forum where we can talk to game changers and leaders in our community to help break down those silos and really you know, stimulate um, entrepreneurship and innovation and take that to another level. So you'll be seeing our monthly video podcasts talk about these types of topics that are relevant to that sort of vision. Uh, I'll turn it over to my co-host now, Anthony Millen. Great. Thanks, Tien. Um, as Tien said, we're really excited to be bringing you our second um, edition of the Monthly Blend. And we uh, are very excited about uh, Bob and Troy as our guests today. As Tian mentioned, in addition to our video podcast, we'll be working on other ways through the monthly blend to, to really drive collaboration in the DMV region. Um, a little bit about myself. I have spent the last 20 years in the startup ecosystem as a serial entrepreneur, a venture capital partner, and a startup attorney. I'm currently a venture partner with Urban Us, a seed stage venture capital fund that focuses on um, urban tech and also the founder and chair of Next, an innovative new model for delivering legal services to startup and emerging growth companies that combines a broad range of fixed price packages and service bundles to provide predictability to our startup and emerging company clients delivered by seasoned senior attorneys in a hands-on high touch approach. And that incorporates a robust technology platform to help drive a very customer centric experience that's collaborative, transparent, and efficient. And with that, we hope you enjoy today's show. Great, may I add Anthony that uh, our viewers and subscribers to please go to themonthlyblend.com and uh, download our video podcast and also subscribe. Welcome everybody. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our two VIP guests today for the Monthly Blend. First, I'd like to introduce Troy LaMail Stolal, or Troy Stolal, who's the new CEO of TEDCO, which is the Maryland Technology Development Corporation. Um, Troy has recently taken the role as the CEO prior to joining uh, Troy was the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at the University of District of Columbia. He's had a storied career in education and ed tech. Uh, before that, he was the President of Zenith Education. <laughs> Prior to that, Troy, you were the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer at Howard University as well. And you also had a stint at Jackson State University. Prior to uh, starting in the education world, uh, you also worked at McKinsey and we're in the financial management business. So uh, we're thrilled to have you. Uh, thank you for joining. And we're looking forward to learning more about what you have to say. And I'd also like to introduce Bob Stolle, who is your counterpart in the uh, Commonwealth of Virginia. Bob is also new in the role as president and CEO of the Center for Innovative Technology um, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And Bob has had a a solid long career at CIT, most recently as the senior VP for policy. And uh, Bob has been working uh, with the state of uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia, as well as uh, in the technology space uh, for a long time. Uh, Bob has been previous head of the Greater Richmond Technology Council. He was also former Secretary of Commerce and Trade for the Commonwealth of Virginia, served in the United States Navy, and is a graduate of the 
United States Naval Academy at Annapolis. Thank you for your service, Bob. Uh, we're you. thrilled to have you. Uh, we're very excited about this because we get to talk about regionalism and how we can work together. And, and both of you are, uh, for the first time, you're both counterparts in both Maryland and Virginia. And this is the first time uh, you guys are together. Uh, and we're, we're thrilled to have you. So thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you for you. inviting me, team. Yeah, thanks for inviding me. Appreciate you being here. Bob, pleasure to meet you. Look forward to working with you over the time. Pleasure to meet you, too. And, and although I, I live uh, and work in Virginia, I was born in Maryland and yes. went to school in Maryland. And so, you know, ha have a, uh, a, a great uh, large place in my heart for uh, the state of Maryland. Outstanding. We'll look forward to that. Great. Well, you know, again, thank you, Bob and Troy, as TN said, for being uh, on the show with us today. Um, in our kind of first segment of today's show, we want to take a look at the ecosystem at a little bit more of a macro level, both the investor community and the ecosystem overall. And what we'd like to start with is just to get your sense when you look at the ecosystem today, again, both in an investor and a startup perspective versus a few years ago, how you see that it has grown and changed. Um, and specifically in this time, how it's been affected by COVID. And so that is, we'd be just very interested in, in starting off with your thoughts around that. Bob, you want to take it? I'll more than happy. Well, sure. I, I will start uh, on this one. And I, I think um, from a general perspective, we, we still see a, a tremendous amount of interest in the startup community. We see the, the um, uh, early stage, particularly from our perspective, technology companies as, as becoming more important to Virginia's economy, more recognized uh, you know, as a critical part of economic growth uh, in Virginia. We're delighted that the, the Commonwealth has actually recognized this value. Sometimes in the past, you know, when you're, you're part of an overall economic development strategy, it's difficult to get people to understand what startups are all about and, you know, the importance of startups, uh, particularly when an investment in a startup might, might not mature or create significant jobs for a number of years. But we in Virginia have just created the Virginia Innovation Partnership Authority, uh, which is a, a collaboration among several economic development groups, but primarily focuses on and recognizes the importance of, of uh, uh, early stage uh, companies, of uh, commercialization and uh, ecosystems throughout the regions. Uh, but the transition over the last few years, I think, in, in the region, we, we've seen a lot of the, the older, more mature funds um, uh, go away, sunset. Uh, you know, if you will, uh, including Valhalla and Novak Biddle, Edison, and and some of the others, and you know, there's been a rise of, of new funds, uh, you know, to take those places, and and you know, a lot of them started by um, uh, new generations of investors, which you know we're we're excited about as well. But um, you know, Squadra, Data Tribe, um, Rise of the Rest, uh, you know, some of the other you know great funds that that are. Um, uh, you know, replacing the the older ones, and you know, one of the other uh, things that, that we see is the the proliferation of uh, accelerators. Now, you know, I think it wasn't long ago that people wondered what are accelerators all about, and and there were a handful. You know, when we started Mach thirty seven, uh, you know, that was kind of a very early stage accelerator. People knew about Y Combinator and Techstars and and some of the others, but you know, a uh, an industry focused accelerator on cybersecurity seemed to be, you know, a question and it's still doing well, um, still doing exceptionally well. And I think people are, are uh, getting a lot of value out of the accelerators. Um, from, from our perspective at CIT, GAP has been uh, recognized. It continues to be recognized. And thank you again, TN, for, for your contribution to, to that process. But, you know, for the sixth year in a row, it's been uh, get CIT GAP fund has been uh, identified as the, the most active fund in Virginia. Um, and continues, we, we now have a leverage ratio of 36 to 1 for the investments that we make and, and, and have leveraged over a billion dollars through that. So from a COVID perspective, uh, you know, just very briefly, I, I 
I've seen less impact than we anticipated. I think we, we were all really concerned early on uh, that, that this would be the end of, uh, of risk taking uh, for a while and, uh, you know, kind of a drop off in the overall number. But we haven't, certainly there's some of that. Uh, people ha have uh, pulled back to a certain extent, but, you know, we've we continue to see a lot of interest in, in early stage companies and, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, interest in, in the follow on investments as well. But, uh, you know, in, in early stage and seed rounds where uh, we tend to, to play, we've seen uh, a, a significant amount of interest uh, continue into um, the what we hope is the later stages of this this COVID. So, um not to repeat, but because I, I agree with everything that Bob said there uh, at, at the macro level. And, and, and so, so I think I'll add a couple things I'll add to that is that obviously pertains to Maryland. Uh, actually, happy to announce uh, that, you know, just yesterday or two days ago, uh, the governor announced what we have in here in Maryland called the Future 20, uh, the 20 companies, startup companies that represent kind of the future of Maryland. And of those 20, 13 of them were through TEDCO or have TEDCO funding. And so there's, there's a momentum to, to, to that. And I think uh, Bob is exactly right. I mean, one of the things we talk about here uh, in Maryland uh, is that we're not gonna, if we're, if we're talking about just restarting what was you know, the, the economy in, in February and in January, we will have lost one of the many lessons other than just how to use Zoom uh, uh, that we've learned over these last several months. We've got to, and I know we're gonna talk about diversity later on, but there is a, an opportunity for us to, to rethink reposition and reimagine the economy and how do we have more participation in that economy by more folks. And, I, and, and Bob is right that we're going to innovate our way out of this. We're not going to just come out of this. We're going to have to innovate. And that's going to be led uh, by, by, by these startup companies, uh, both in the technology space and the non-technology space. I think we, we have to be more open to that and more open to individuals being a part of that. So we're excited about that in Tedco, but I think the other part, again, to specifics that we're trying to do here is better engage um, uh, our higher educational institutions. And so we've got a number of instruments that we're doing where we're actually investing directly uh, in, in trying to create entrepreneurial chairs at, at our universities so through our e-innovation fund that, that we have here in Maryland. Uh, we've got through our Maryland Innovation Initiative, how we do tech transfer and acceleration of tech transfer. And, you know, I would be remiss given, given COVID-10, um, you know, the, the role that, uh, that uh, Maryland plays around life sciences. So we have obviously a very robust life sciences a quarter, especially around 270. A lot of the, some of the vaccine work that has, has taken place here in Maryland, a, a, a big, I forget the number, I used to have the number, big, there's been a significant investment from the Project Warp Speed that has made its way into Maryland. And so not only are we trying to integrate those elements of the higher ed and the private sector. But the last point for me is uh, the federal assets here. And so how do we rethink those federal assets and how do we begin uh, to do what I'm calling spin in and spin out uh, those federal assets. And for me, those federal assets includes the, the federal labs as well as the, uh, the, the number of military bases that we have here in Maryland. There, that, that represents a large chunk of folks that we need to be investing in. And how do we use SBIRs and SCTRs? We just, uh, TEDCO just got awarded uh, some grants around that. And we're, we're launching a university type model to teach people how to use and access to that capital. And, and to, close, to close on this, um, again, Bob's right that, that there is an interesting shift that is happening in the capital markets here in the DMV uh, where the traditional funds are, are becoming less. And so I think part of what I'm seeing at least is um, there is still a gap there in that early stage, seed stage, in terms of creating a lot of energy there. There's still some gaps there, and we're trying to fill that. And it sounds like CIT is as well, which are gap fund. So we've got to find more ways to get that funding there, because I think there is clearly there available kind of in that A round and beyond, there's, a, there's accessibility there. But uh, again, how do you get that, you know, particularly for us, and I think you guys have probably had this in Virginia as well, that pre-revenue, pre-seed dollars? How do you kind of get the idea out of ideation stage and allow them enough money to move from ideation to at least some element of seed and then some element of, of actually launch? And so those, those elements there, I think, Teen, are, there's still some struggles there uh, in terms of a robustness of the capital markets around that. But we're trying to fill out, it sounds like CIT gap is as well. You know, and, and if I can just follow up real quickly, I don't, I, I don't want to delay 
this, but, you know, Troy, you hit on really good, good point. And, and some of that, you know, we just refer to as pipeline, mm -hmm. um, you know, how with, with all of the really great things that are going on, um, how, how do we take some of those early stage companies and, and get them to the level where some of the, the angels and, and others are, are seeing them and whether it's commercialization of IP out of universities or the private sector. Um, but, you know, exactly as you said, getting, Getting the pipeline, the way that, that, that we improve the process right now is ensuring that, that those companies that, that should be um, gr growth opportunities are recognized and, and, you know, we capitalize on the various programs that Absolutely. exist. Oh, absolutely. No, I mean, look, and, and I think, you know, again, I again, again, not, to your point, I'm trying to take away from the program. We can, and even though you're focused on Virginia and I'm focused on Maryland, I'm glad teams connected us because the reality of it is we're DMV and the, the, we got a river that separates us, but that's all it is. You know, it's just a road that separates us. And, yeah, you know, what happens in Maryland influences Virginia and what happens in Virginia influences Maryland. And, and uh, I've made it clear to my legislators, at least, that um, I get the uh, as just an example of, of kind of cross the river stuff. So we I just signed a deal with the uh, Navy, the Naval X folks, you know, they're spin out of the Naval Technologies to sure. help fund a, uh, a great makerspace in Alexandria. It's a beautiful makerspace that's in Alexandria. Mm -hmm. um, and it's using TETCO funds to do that. And so uh, I'm looking forward to beyond this conversation by working to try to, how do we make this a uh, more accessible capital markets, particularly for those early pipeline ideas. For us, that's just very exciting. You know, when Tien and I started talking about the monthly blend, one of the um, ideas that we spoke about is just the power of our region as a region. And, um, you know, these kinds of conversations that, that we're kind of seeing unfolding today are, are really exciting to us. Um, you know, when we talk about the region, one of the things we'd be interested to, um, to hear from both of you is, is as, as you look at the region, what you see are some of the unique strengths. There are a lot of people who will be looking at this from inside and outside the region, but what do you see as some of the unique strengths that we have um, in, in our region? And you know, wh what, are some of, what are some of the challenges that you have that you'd like to see us work on as, as a macro region? Yeah, if I may, I mean, I just spoke of the higher, I mean, the, the, if you just take Northern Virginia, DC and, and Maryland and the area just around uh, the DC area, um, I mean, you've got just an amazing number of higher education institutions. If you go all the way, you go to Baltimore and then you even take your way down to Virginia, kind of that 95 corridor. If you just take that 95 corridor from Richmond to, to Baltimore, we got an amazing just young talent base that, that perhaps it hasn't been tapped into. And, 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 and how do you start to look at them? And again, one of the things we're going to try to do is not so much always talk about tech transfer, because that's, you know, that's the, the traditional conversation with higher ed. But how do we just spur entrepreneurship? How do I get that kid that's just thinking about a great idea uh, and how do we connect them and how do we make them, um, you know, one of the, you know, we got what, five of us on this call here. I said, people, if I ask the five of us, the definition of an ecosystem, I probably get 10 different definitions. And so my 11th is the definition of me of a well-functioned ecosystem is any, this is a great example today, any two people or any two organizations, the degrees of separation between them has to be minimized. That's how you build a strong ecosystem because people know people and people can connect to people and people can connect the things that need to be connected. And so I think that's great. I think in terms of challenges, they're the traditional ones you have that, you know, I've been involved with this. It's everything from the transportation to housing uh, to, to, to diversity uh, in, in this eco participation, this ecosystem. Those things have to be solved because if, if people can't afford to live here, if people can't afford to get around and people don't feel a part of it, then um, all we've really done is allowed the top to continue to be the wealthy to be wealthier and haven't done anything around wealth expansion or wealth, uh, or wealth generation. Uh, you know, I, I would say one of the strengths of the region is the ability to attract attention. Um, you know, mm -hmm. folks that want to compete with Silicon Valley or, you know, New York or, or some other areas and keep saying, why, why aren't we getting that kind of attention? We certainly need to get, get more attention. But I think the region does attract attention for a variety of different reasons internationally. And, and, and that's important. Uh, most of what we see out of other parts of, of Virginia are, um, uh, you know, concerned that 
they don't get attention, you know, that there may be a great idea in a company in Richmond or, you know, in Roanoke or, you know, someplace and, and they can't get the attention of investors because investors, you know, don't look beyond, you know, a certain number of, of uh, you know, limited areas. And, and quite honestly, you know, if you're getting all of the deals you need from, you know, a handful of areas, then you ask yourself, well, why do I need to travel to these places? But, you know, it's one of the, the, the potential opportunities that we see, we, we just hosted a the, the uh, Virginia uh, Demo Day, a- and we had uh, co- cohort companies from three different accelerators in Virginia, 757, uh, Lighthouse Labs, and Ramp. Uh, 20 cohort companies make presentations to 60 investors. And, and you know, in, in the past, people would look at those types of, of demos and, and pitches as as being second rate, you know, or, or we, we don't want to do online. We don't want to see videos. We don't, but now this is an opportunity. It was actually the investors afterwards that said, wow, this was a great opportunity to see 20 companies in a short period of time, you know, and, and then get together with the ones that, that we're interested in. So, you know, I, I think we have the opportunity to spread some of the visibility that we have in the national capital region, um, you know, beyond just um, the the beltway. Uh, you know, as far as some of the strengths, clearly, you know, cybersecurity, data analytics, um, you know, enterprise and in, in data intensive, you know, machine learning uh, in the national capital region are, are all, they're going to continue to be um, huge opportunities. And that's where, you know, from the Virginia side, that that's the focus. And, and we at, at CIT, we do have a focus on high tech, high growth. So, you know, that's one of the areas we want to branch out with, particularly when we start to look at more minority founders and minority funders, we want to branch out beyond just the, 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 high tech, the, the small list of technology industries that, that we want to focus. You know, in other parts of Virginia, we see, uh, you know, companies that, that are doing well in, in ed tech and, and food tech and fintech and, and, and you know, uh, all of these uh, other areas that, that are uh, driving the economy right now. So we want to make sure that we're, we're providing opportunities. We, like, like Maryland, we've got an unbelievably diverse economy dependent on you know, what region you're in. And, and, you know, we need to make sure that we're providing uh, opportunities for folks in Roanoke and Southwest that are interested in ag tech, you know, as much as um, cybersecurity and, and data analytics and some of the other, uh, you know, areas that are going to continue to grow in, in Northern Virginia. Great. You know, as we, as we look forward now um, for the, the last part of the segment, I'd be very interested as we look forward a few years, um, where you'd like to see us as a region, both from the investor community perspective, from a startup ecosystem perspective. If you were stepping forward three to five years and, and kind of looking at where you'd like us to be, um, what, what would that look like to you? And what do you think are some of the steps that we could take today that start us along that pathway? So um, I've talked about this a lot. I mean, if, 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 if you have a very robust funding, early funding cycle, the role of TEDCO dramatically changes. Um, and, you know, it, the, the short version of that is if we do this right, we work our way out of what we do today. And, and that's a good thing. If we could work our way out of what we do today, then that's a good thing. And that allows us to redeploy those resources in a very different way. Because if there's enough of an energy and enough of a robustness, and, a, and as Bob talked about, an identification and the recognition of, of, of those funding opportunities and, and, the, and the markets kind of work, um, that would be great. And, and, and the markets are inclusive in doing the things that include um, not just uh, the, not just from a conversation of women or people of color, but socioeconomic. That there's a, there's an inclusion in that. Then that would be that would be you know that that's panacea. Um, and to to get us there, you know, one of the things we're trying to do, being more intentional, Anthony and Tina, around not just the founders. We we have a lot of conversations. You know, we all in this venture business, we tend to focus on the founders, but you know, part of what we also got to focus on is what we are calling employee number three through pick a number. Right. And how do you get employee number three to be a student or a young person who but for would never be part of that ecosystem? They're from one of our HBCUs or from one of our regional institutions. And they wouldn't not from the Hopkins of the world, but, you know, from a Frostburg or from a Morgan State. 
How do we get them to be employee number three, four, five? Because by the way, if these things even become halfway successful, that employee number three from Morgan State who becomes successful, they become the next generation and the next, and the flywheel does happen. And that's back to my first point and my closing point. How do we create that flywheel so that everything kind of works in the way that it should, but includes people that but for would not be included because of our intentionality of making those things happen? Well, and I, I agree entirely. And, and, you know, I would say we, it would be, we'd be successful if we could find a way to better ca- catalyze the, the private capital in the investment community, how we, we coordinate better, um, you know, between the various stages, whether, you know, it, it's seed funding or, you know, and, and how do you transition? Do you abandon, do, do we as an organization abandon, uh, you know, companies after they've found a seed you know, uh, gone through a seed round successfully, and, and we don't. We have follow-on investment. We, you know, um, ha- have mentorship. Uh, you know, but sometimes, uh, you know, you, th- there are opportunities that fall through the cracks. We, we just recently, you all may have seen the announcement in in the Tech Wire that uh, a company called ID.me, um, you know, is creating a thousand new jobs in Virginia. And uh, we CIT, the the Gap Fund, was first in with them in, in a hundred thousand dollar investment that, that uh, you know, uh, catalyzed their seed round. They went on to raise $41 million. They had created 200 jobs and, and now are creating 1,000 more. And, and what's really cool in there is that, um, you know, our economic development partnership has also played a role in that now in keeping them, you know, and helping them to grow uh, through some of the incentive programs. So it's, there's not just one solution or one organization. It's a matter of, of being able to coordinate and collaborate and all pull in the same, and quite honestly, not just in Virginia, but being able to work with TEDCO, you know, as I've spoken with, with um, you know, our uh, chief investment officer, Tom Whiteman, you know, he just speaks so highly of what Maryland is doing in TEDCO and how, you know, the, it, as you say, it's it's a river, you know, there are bridges across that river. So, you know, we, we need to coordinate, um, you know, a little better. But I'll also say that I, I would like to, and, and, and certainly some of the, the recent, you know, news brings to the attention the, the lack of, of uh, opportunities potentially for diverse investors, um, you know, and, and we'll talk more about that, I know, in, in the future. But um, opportunities, we, we had a, uh, a panel discussion recently where we had uh, minority investors and, and uh, founders, and it was so enormously helpful um, to, to get perspective on what's going right and what's going wrong. But the idea that somehow um, uh, this, the national capital region could be something of of a um, uh, a, a catalyst for those types of of uh, initiatives and funds and and success stories and I think what we really need a few years a year from now is some nice success stories and that'll get the attention that'll get the uh, the additional uh, capital so I always want to follow up with something Bob said and I was remiss in not mentioning it so um I just uh, was on a call about well, about a month maybe a month or so gal go now where a group of uh, folks got together and they, they a chapter got formed here in the DMV around Black VC called the Black VC group. And, you know, these are folks who, if, if we had had this call, they, several people in the call, it's, there was like 40 to 50 people in the call. If we'd had this call just five or 10 years ago, there might've been 20 people on the call. Um, and so to have that number and to Bob's point, these are people who've come out of the Novak's bill of the world who would, you know, rise of the rest. And so you've got individuals uh, who, are, who are now in a position uh, to be able to have a conversation uh, that represent, you know, have different representation. So we'd spend a lot of time talking about founders and entrepreneurship, but it's also important, important to talk about the diversification that needs to happen on the funder side that you have individuals that are, that are running and are partners or principals at these, at these venture capital firms. And in many cases, you have individuals who are starting out. We had a young man who just left uh, Tedco, uh, Mac McIver, who's gotten a lot of great press. He just started a fund out of Baltimore, um, a rare breed. And so we're very excited about what he's doing. And so that kind of, those types of individuals and looking at the, the, the type of work that they're doing that's the type of thing, Bob, we got to also have. We got to have not just diversification of the, of the entrepreneurship and the talent there, but also the funders who do this as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
No, that is, you know, is so important for, for the region. And um, I want to thank you both for just providing this insight and vision for our region in terms of where we are and, and where we have been and, and more importantly, where we're going and highlighting some of the strengths of the region. What I'd like to do now is hand it over to TN and we're going to focus a little bit more specifically on TEDCO and CIT. And um, Tien, I hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, great insight so far, Bob and Troy. Thank you guys very much for that. Um, you know, one thing is very coincidental is that both of you are within two to three months of your roles <laughs> as CEO. And I know, Bob, you've been at CIT for a long time, so you know the ins and outs. And Troy, you've been active in the community, so you know what's going on. But um, can you take a moment and articulate your vision? I mean, every CEO has a vision, right? You have an idea of where you want the organization to go, where we want to focus. I think we've touched on a lot of that already. But um, if you could, if you don't mind, and we have a new year coming, so maybe you can take a few moments and talk about your briefly, you know, your vision for the organization now that you're, you know, at the helm and what your top two or three priorities will be for 2021. Bob, you want to well, lead us? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll be happy to, to lead. We at, we at CIT and in Virginia, we're going through a tremendous transition because we just had a, a change uh, legislation that was passed in the last year that, that now consolidates several different organizations and all, all in a very positive way. Sometimes consolidations, you know, um, sound uh, Machiavellian, but, uh, you know, this is all bringing together organizations that focus on economic development, well, focus primarily on, on entrepreneurial uh, and startup economic development. And it's into the Virginia Innovation Partnership Authority, and, and we've also consolidated some centers of excellence that will be part of that effort, but there's increased funding from the Commonwealth. And as I mentioned earlier, there's an increased recognition of the value um, of uh, entrepreneurship. As we go forward, um, you know, I, part of, uh, and I'll say my vision, but part of our, our charge you know, it is to make sure that every region within the Commonwealth uh, uh, has an opportunity to grow their uh, respective entrepreneurial ecosystems. Um, we have an, a, a uh, program in Virginia called uh, or, or um, Go Virginia, which kind of divides the Commonwealth into nine different economic regions. And, and uh, within each region, there's an economic uh, or, or an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, and we are our goal is to make sure that Northern Virginia is not the only successful ecosystem that we have in Virginia, that in fact, we are developing programs and, and working with the, the regional ecosystems to develop um, tailored programs that support the growth of entrepreneurship in their individual regions. Um, it's been too, too easy in the past to say, you know, well, you, you want to know about entrepreneurship in, in Virginia? Well, let's talk about nine different stovepipes, um, mm -hmm. you know, and we can't do that any longer. We've got to be able to bring together um, each of those regions to have a story about entrepreneurship and success stories in Virginia that include all of those regions. We've got to be able to, to brand and market um, the opportunities that exist in Virginia, but make sure that people understand that's not just Northern Virginia and it's not just cybersecurity and data analytics, but that there are a tremendous number uh, of um, opportunities uh, for us. So th that's our vision, bringing, bringing it together, um, uh, bringing these nine different regions regions together to create one macro uh, ecosystem uh, in Virginia. But, you know, also, I, I want to focus uh, again on uh, if we don't expand the opportunities for minority women, veteran and rural entrepreneurs, then we've really failed. Um, you know, we we have programs that focus on that. We can talk about that more, you know, in a later question, Tian, if you'd, if you'd like. But you know, we we really need to to take a look at how we're doing things. In in the, the recent um, forum that we had with the minority entrepreneurs and, and and funders, boy, one of the the clear things was that you've got to understand the 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 investors need to understand the communities they're investing in. And if we in Virginia say we're only going to invest in high tech, high growth, you know, in a handful, then we're going to miss out on the vast majority of opportunities in the minority community. 
um, because you know the, the, there are more Main Street types of initiatives, great investment opportunities. You know, but in in order to capitalize on that, we need to understand you know the 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 culture better, understand the culture, um, and um, you know the so some of the challenges when it comes to friends and family, and some of the other initiatives that that the the minority founders and uh, you know are uh, are experiencing. So you know that's my vision. One, we, we, we really need to crack that nut. We really need to, to uh, make advances along that line as a part of our overall um, single vision for entrepreneurship and innovation in Virginia that also includes commercialization, you know, out of our universities and, and early stage companies. So sounds real familiar. I mean, I could repeat a lot of it. Bob said. I think the the thing that I'd add to that, though, so yeah. I was glad to be able to go first on that one, Troy. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm piggybacking on you, buddy. Um, the word I'd add to to what Bob said is is what I call knitting. Uh, Tedco has to become the great knitter uh, of this thing called ecosystem. And I actually say it a little differently. I'm an engineer by training, but I I think words matter, uh, and, and so. Actually, like I said earlier, the ecosystem has to become tighter and people have to know one another. And actually it's about reducing the size and that, that sounds counterintuitive, but the whole point of if you've knitted it together, it becomes tighter and it becomes much more efficient. And so part of the role of Tedco, we're trying to move beyond just, not just the funding that we do, but how do we really build this really thing, this robust thing that we call an ecosystem or, or innovation culture. And, and Bob is right, is, 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 is if, if we don't think through how to include others and that others is not just a women's conversation or a, a veterans conversation or people of color, but it's rural areas as well. And, and, and again, I don't know the stats for Virginia, but I, what we're seeing because of COVID is, is a mass, some, I won't say a mass, but some de-urbanization is happening. Uh, we're running out of housing stock on the Eastern shore. We're running out of housing stock in some of our Western Maryland uh, communities. I just got those reports here in the last couple of weeks. And so as you think about this, 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 this distribution of talent into these areas, how do we take advantage of that? How do we take advantage of the fact that we, you know, I believe that we're no longer gonna have five days in the office. You have to be in the office type of, you know, a work model that Zoom is gonna be an integral part of whatever we do. You're not trying to make a political statement or a medical statement about this vaccine, but you know, we're, gonna, we're gonna get past this you know, as, a, as a country and we're gonna get past this. And so what is our behavior gonna look like differently? And, and how do we fact, take the fact that people are gonna now be not having to all be clustered in urban areas. Now that that talent could be somewhere else, how do you get opportunities that exist in other parts of the state? And, and the other thing, and I didn't mention when you guys asked an earlier question, but it's an important point. When Bob was talking about accelerators, or incubators and accelerators, one of the things that one of the things that we are trying to do here in Tedco, back to that nitty, is understanding how to better leverage these all of these incubator and accelerators because they're all kind of working independently as to working more as 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 a whole. And, and one of the things that we we've, we've identified, particularly given our emphasis around life sciences, Bob, is you know how do we get more wet lab spaces and more you know. Uh, uh, flexible lab, lab spaces? How do we get more what I call light manufacturing spaces? And so how do we create, you know, people talked about, you know, how do you get the WeWorks model going less about office and more about working labs uh, and, and manufacturing? And so those are the things that, you know, how do we knit those things together, not replicate them and duplicate them? How do we, how do we make sure we knit them and make sure that the incubator in, in Frederick is leveraging the work that's going on in Baltimore? How do I make sure what's happening on Eastern Shore is doing what's doing? And, and, and so how do we knit those things together? Because as you, you and I both know, there's only a dollar of resources available. And so how do I stretch that dollar and leverage that dollar in a fundamentally different way as opposed to everybody getting their one dollar? What if we develop, and one of the things we're trying to do here in Maryland is, is what I call, how do we develop coalitions of the willing? How do we get a group of people around one or two specific themes as opposed to each of us asking for a dollar how do we ask for the 500 we know we really need and we all kind of give up as, as, I, as I like to say, Bob here, you, you, can't build an, you can't build an ecosystem if you got too many ego systems. And so you, you gotta, we all gotta give up some ego if we're gonna build an ecosystem. And, and if we don't rethink, if, if, if all we do is what we did, you and I both have the definition of insanity. And so we gotta re, COVID has allowed us to be entrepreneurial, be innovative in what we do going forward and how we think about 
this notion of knitting things together, Tian, that brings more value to the whole. Because the the I don't know about Virginia's economy, she was just as in, in the dump as as Maryland. You know, uh, uh, the, the, the legislators have a tough, tough job come January. They got a brutally tough job. You know, the numbers are getting worse, seem like every day, and we're all basically we effectively in a stay-at-home model at this point. Um, and so the economy isn't going to recover anytime soon. So therefore, I'm even more emphasis that the, we're going to have to innovate our way out of this. And so as Tedco, to your point, team, the vision for us is how do we how do we leverage more than of what we have? How do we better knit together what we have? How do we operate better than what we have? And how do we tell our story better than what we have? Right. Well, thank you guys for that feedback. It's remarkable how similar the dynamics are in both of the states and how similar the challenges are. And I really applaud your ability to be so entrepreneurial and to pivot into areas of opportunity that will drive growth in both Virginia and Maryland. Um, I'd like to go a little deeper on a topic that we've touched on, which is diversity and inclusion. You know, this is a, a tremendously exciting development these past several months, a long time coming in my opinion. It's a national movement, it's a regional movement. I think we've talked a little bit about uh, what you got, the, the fact that it's important to you, um, but I'd like to know more about, you know, are either of your funds specifically allocating to these underserved markets of minorities, women, immigrants, veterans, rural? Um, you know, how are you doing that? What challenges do you face in terms of uh, finding quality deal flow, finding quality talent, um, amazing companies uh, in the DM, DMV region specifically, um, how are you going to actually put the plan into action, you know, go from strategy to tactics on this? I'm very yeah. curious. So we have two specific funds, uh, one called the Builder Fund. Again, people can go to tedco.md, tedcomd.com uh, to, to find. One is the Builder Fund team. And the other is the rural, uh, the rural initiatives fund, and both of them, the characteristics are is just like the, the builder fund is focused on quote uh, disad socioeconomic disadvantaged groups. Um, you and I would say you know women and people of color, but it also does include you know again, uh, poor rural folks as well. And so that fund is set up to provide tranches of funds to to uh, to these individuals, but it also tie in to the question you're really asking. Uh, we don't just provide the money. We provide some wraparound support. We actually pay for executives to to shadow these individuals. We we wrap them around. We actually have a series of of, of different classes and webinars. That, obviously, webinars now uh, that we do to because many of these folks, you know, they they're brilliant people, but they don't know a balance sheet. They don't know a talent plan. They don't know a marketing plan. So we we wrap that around them, and we, we do the same thing with these rural funds and. Very happy to announce, you know, some of these funds have become have, have now followed on with um, uh, uh, institutional capital uh, in, in our builder fund of the we do them in cohorts of the we're in our third cohort about to go into our fourth of the 20 ish some companies, six of them now are onto their next round of institutional capital. So that's, you know, that's pretty darn good. So yeah. the, the model works, but we know we can do better um, and we're going to do better. We're rethinking it and, and, and reimagining it. The same thing with the rural fund. But I'll close with, you know, I've, I've told the legislators, the challenge with this thing is conceptually great idea, um, but there's not enough scale in it. You know, it's like throwing a pebble uh, into the ocean at high tide and expecting to see something different. You're, you're just not. And so, again, we, we're going to do what we do what we do. But I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say I'm out looking for other resources, both from the state and, and non-state, to provide a little bit more scale, because you really do need more scale uh, to, make the, to make a real difference. Yes. Agreed. From from our perspective, uh, within the programs that, that we have at CIT, the, I mentioned the Gap Fund earlier, and the Gap Fund, for those that don't know, um, makes direct equity investments in in early stage companies and high tech, high growth companies, and it, it is um, um, general fund dollars that come from from uh, the the General Assembly <clears throat> and from the Commonwealth. And our, our goal with that is to leverage private sector investment. Tian, you're involved in that process. We make small $100,000, $200,000 investments. And the idea is to get the attention to, to do a little bit of de-risking for uh, private investors that, that then follow on uh, in a seed round or, or later stages. And, and um, 
that's gone exceptionally well. As Troy says, uh, you know, it's a matter of scale, you know, just how much impact can you have? Um, But it's gone exceptionally well um, for us. We are seeing returns on the investments that that have been made uh, in the past. And with those returns, we created um, the Virginia Founders Fund and uh, at at a proceeds. And we have more flexibility in how we use proceeds than we do with the appropriated dollars. Mm -hmm. And so we're using that to create the Virginia Virginia Founders Fund, which specifically focuses on uh, minority women, veteran, and rural entrepreneurs. Um, so uh, we also now are in the process of creating what we, a, a kind of a, a, a sister um, a program called the Virginia Founders Initiative. Uh, we One of the tough things that we find in the Founders Fund is that You create a program, but that doesn't mean people are going to be knocking down your door, you know, saying, hey, I'm a minority, I'm a veteran. You still need to find those opportunities. You need to cultivate them. You need that pipeline that we talked about in the past. So our Virginia Founders Initiative is is being developed to work um, not not to create a a top-down program that that stretches into each one of the regions, but to fund... um, Uh, programs that are developed by the regions that focus Mm -hmm. on their specific needs. If you look at Hampton Roads, yes, there's a a, a large um, uh, minority community in Hampton Roads, but also think of the veterans, uh, you know, that there are the the folks, I think it's the number one Mm -hmm. city or or region in the country for people getting out of the military. Um, And and so, you know, we've got to be able to take advantage of that. But um, so the Virginia Founders Initiative is going to um, help develop regional programs that, that focus on those four categories, the, the uh, women, uh, minorities, veterans, and, and rural. We've had some, some really great success stories out of the VFF already where, you know, that has moved into um, larger gap investments um, as well. But, you know, part of what we've learned over, you know, certainly over, over the last few months and in the discussions that we've had is, is that, you know, we, we want to break out the um, I, you know, I won't say just the minority uh, founders, but black founders, um, you know, and we want to understand the companies that they're building um, and, and um, the, the, the culture that they're, they're coming from. And I'll say better understand, um, but that goes back to the earlier comment about you can't say we're only investing in technology. You know, you've, you've got to be a cybersecurity company for us to be interested in you. You know, if you're a, a black founder, we've got to understand um, the, the companies that they're building. And that needs to be part of our, our overall um, uh, set of priorities. So um, we, we do have programs focused on this. We've got um, uh, a, a series of initiatives that we're um, you know, just in the early stages of now with the new Virginia Innovation Partnership Authority um, to expand what we're currently doing. But you know, to a large extent, we're in a learning mode. You know, we, we really want to better understand what needs to be done, what, what, you know, how can we support both the founders. And, and part of it, I, you know, I, I think, Troy, you touched on as well, it's not just black founders. It's, you know, the, the investors. We need more um, minority investors who understand the, the individuals, you know, rather than just immediately reject them because they don't have, you know, a history of friends and family or, you know, large credit card debt, you know, or, or you know, whatever other. Uh, so we're really excited about it. I, you know, I, we think this is great, and, and we've got strong support from uh, Governor Northam and the administration, and they're, they're delighted to see us uh, headed in this direction. The other thing I want to add to what Bob is saying, and, and back to my thing of knitting the, the infra- this ecosystem together, is when you look at a, like a space like life science is a good example. You know, you just don't have a lot of blacks or women in that space because of the the academic requirements to to be in that space. But what we back to knitting. A uh, huge underlying of, 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 of life science is going to be things around bioinformatics and the role of data. And so that's a space that we're going to try to find a way because there are a number of blacks that are in computer science and women that are in computer science or that, that are in data. And so that's how you get them in. So they might be in the core life sciences, but things around bioinformatics, data analytics, they clearly can have a role there. And so how do we get them into those into that sector through another means than the traditional hard science part of it. And so it's being creative and thinking differently about what supports that life science, what what supports cyber or supports agri-tech 
or Aquatech. What supports clean energy? There are these, there are these uh, what I call horizontal uh, skill sets that you do have some, some, uh, some volume of, of women and blacks who are in those and that's how you get them introduced into those sectors. Well, this has been great. I, I'm so excited and so motivated about what both of you are doing. And I know we're running short on time. I have one final question. It's a quickie. Uh, we have a lot of listeners from around the region, um, as well as around the country, who are probably loving what you guys are saying. They're very excited about the initiatives that both TEDCO and CIT are doing. How can they get involved? Like, what? How can you know, a mentor or an investor or an entrepreneur, how can they get involved with, with your organizations? And where can they help? Yeah, yeah. So as I said, you know, tedcomd.com is our website. Um, TN, we have this group called Network Advisors. These are individuals like yourself who are experienced entrepreneurs and have a skill set, and we bring them in as network advisors. You can, you can come to our site and find out, more, and we assign them to companies, and so they can be a part of our, our network advisors group. And so, we, and as I mentioned a few moments ago, with our rural initiatives and our uh, builder funders initiative, we have uh, executives uh, who, frankly, we pay in many cases to go and spend time with these companies, uh, these early stage companies. So, number of ways that we folks can get involved with us. So, I, again, welcome them to come visit our website to find out more. And I, uh, th- that's the same advice that, that I offer folks. It, it's not an easily understandable area, you know, a business that, that you know, to, to comprehend sometimes, um, you know, and, and so it, the details of the specific programs and the criteria and how do you get an investment and, and you know, CIT.org, um, you know, I mean, the, all the information is there, but I'll say each one of our divisions has an advisory um, committee. Uh, uh, our investment division, TN, as you know, um, has a, a, a number of really just well-qualified, experienced investors that, that help us to make the decisions. We don't go out on our own and pick somebody and say, we're going to put money into you. There's a, a, a detailed process and same thing with commercialization. So the, we have hundreds of of people that are engaged in this. And if somebody asked me, if I met somebody at a reception and said, how do I get involved? My first question would be, well, where do you live? You know, what, what region are you in? Let's start you off by getting engaged where you are, you know, rather than, and, and you know, let's build this from, make sure we've got a strong regional ecosystem. And Troy, by the way, I am stealing your quote that, that you can't, uh, you've got to get rid of the ego system before you can create an ecosystem. I, I'll give you credit for it when I use it, but I am going to use that one. That's, that's great. And it's so true. It, it is so true. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I think we would love to see people get involved, help us create that pipeline that we've talked about, help build those ecos- those regional ecosystems so that it, it creates a, a better, um, uh, creates better deal flow coming to us and then also going beyond CIT, you know, let's, so sometimes people want to start at the top, you know, the federal government, what do I need to do, you know, with the White House, you know, to make something happen. And, and where you as you know, where you really make things happen is locally. Um, so look for opportunities locally. I couldn't agree more. Exactly correct. Great. Well, thank you guys both for sharing and also for spending so much time with us. Uh, I, I'm thrilled. I'm so happy for both organizations that they have such amazing, talented uh, leadership at the top. And we really, uh, I hope the two of you can collaborate together as well. And- Bob, I'll be sending you an email as soon as we <laughs> hang up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I will be responding immediately, Troy. And anything Anthony and I can do to help, please let us know. And, and hopefully some of our viewers will be jumping in and assisting as well. But this has been really informative, extremely inspiring. Um, I'll turn it over to Anthony for for closing remarks. Um, Anthony? Great. Thank you, Tien. I just wanted to say again to Bob and Troy, thank you so much for being on the show with us today and for sharing such tremendous thoughts and insights, your leadership and the importance and impact that TEDCO and CIT have both in your respective states, but also the impact that they have. And as we see more and more um, of the region collaboration that can happen, just the impact that that, that's gonna have on the region as well. So thank you again. Thank you, appreciate you guys. Thank you, Anthony, thank you.